Fall semester will conclude our debates next Tuesday at 7 o'clock, same room, with the question, should we have open borders? So uh, please uh, come out for that as well. If you'd like a reminder on future programs this semester or next semester, there's a sign-up sheet on the glass table right behind the media booth here. That's not the class sign-in or the Excel sign-in. And uh, you're welcome to put your name and address, email address on there, and I'll put you on a list, and then you can be aware of the programs. We're already working on programs for next semester that I think are going to be quite good. It's also important, uh, if you've got a questionnaire, and we actually ran out of questionnaires, that you fill that questionnaire out. It's for the Institute for Humane Studies, and they are one of our co-sponsors, founded in 1961 and located in Arlington, Virginia. The Institute for Humane Studies advances a uh, freer society by facilitating the development of students and scholars who share an interest in liberty. And if you have a question about Institute for Humane uh, Studies programs, please contact contact me and I'll be happy to assist you. And they, in turn, are uh, aided by the John Templeton Foundation, which serves as a philanthropic catalyst for discoveries related to the big questions of human purpose and ultimate reality. Uh, so when you're done with those questionnaires, uh, there will be baskets in a box. There's a box on the glass table right behind the media booth, and there will be some baskets, too. Just go ahead and put them in there. And uh, you can also, on there, there's a spot where you can tell us who you think won the debate, which uh, I always love to get those results and to send them to the speakers. Uh, so please fill that in as well. And one of you will get a $25 gift card from Amazon, so that is further incentive uh, to uh, fill those out as well. You get free stuff. So go ahead and do that. Um, before I introduce our moderator, let me explain our format. Uh, we'll begin tonight with 15-minute opening statements from our speakers. Professor Weisskopf, who's on my left, will go first, and Professor Perry, who's on my right, will follow. And then they will have five minutes to ask questions of one another in that order. And then the moderator, Dr. Matchek, who will be up here shortly, will have the prerogative to ask questions for five minutes. That'll take us about 45 minutes. Then we'll take a 10-minute break. And uh, you can stretch your legs and uh, use the restroom, whatever you need to do. Uh, but 10 minutes later, after our 10-minute break, uh, we'll resume. And during that 10 minutes, if you have a question for our speakers, uh, we'll have a young lady with uh, three by five or four by six cards. And you just get one of those and uh, fill it out with your question and give it to me or to Dr. Matchek. And uh, we will use those questions during that 10-minute time frame uh, to ask questions of our speakers. And then we'll have closing statements from each of our speakers. And so the whole event will take about 90 minutes from start to finish. Uh, with that, I'll turn the debate over to our moderator, Professor Dale Matchek, who is chair of our economics department here at Northwood University. Dr. Matchek has personal and professional connections with both of our speakers, and I'm very happy to have him helping us out tonight. So with that, please join me in welcoming Professor Matchek. Thank you all for coming. It's uh, wonderful to see so many students here tonight and also members of the community. Welcome. Uh, we are in for a real treat tonight. Uh, we have two distinguished professors of economics with us to debate the issue of whether or not we should increase the minimum wage. An issue which has been around for centuries, uh, where uh, in the Middle Ages people would have talked about the just wage and whether or not uh, the just wage could be properly defined. And uh, the moral dimensions have remained an important part of this debate ever since. Uh, the moral dimension of this minimum wage debate uh, can be illustrated by a quote from Adam Smith's great work, The Wealth of Nations, in which he said, quote, no society can surely be flourishing and happy, of which by far the greater part of its members are poor and miserable. It is but equity, besides, that those who feed, clothe, and lodge the whole body of the people should have such a share of the produce of their own labor as to be themselves toler tolerably well-fed, 
clothed and lodged. Now, Adam Smith, who of course viewed favorably the effects of competition in our economy, generally took a dim view of the effects of competition in determining determination of wages. Thought that workers were at a disadvantage in their bargaining position with respect to the wage, and many of the economists of that era uh, subscribed to this idea that wages would be driven through competition to the level of, sus of subsistence. Um, this did not happen. And in fact, wages rose uh, during the 19th and 20th centuries to such an extent that uh, new theories of wage determination were developed. And by the time I became a student in uh, Professor Weisskopf's class at the University of Michigan many years ago, it was the uh, conventional wisdom that minimum wages were bad policy, although the moral arguments may be persuasive, the economic analysis did not support them. Since then, there has been something of a sea change among mainstream economists with respect to this question of the minimum wage. And uh, just last year, over 600 economists, including many Nobel Prize winners, uh, signed a letter uh, which uh, recommended increasing the minimum wage. Among these economists, Paul Krugman, for example, who in his textbook had suggested that the minimum wage was bad policy, he signed the letter as well. So people are changing their minds, uh, many prominent economists among them. So it will be very interesting to hear what our speakers have to say about this important topic. Our uh, first speaker tonight will be Professor Thomas Weisskopf, who retired recently from the University of Michigan after more than four decades of teaching. Uh, he was a joint uh, appointment in the Residential College, their innovative um, educational program, their university within the university, and with the economics department there. Prior to coming to the University of Michigan, he was professor at, assistant professor at Harvard University, and prior to that, he had worked uh, for a while in development economics at the Indian Statistical Institute, and uh, uh, he received his um, education at Harvard University and uh, his doctorate uh, at MIT, Massachusetts uh, Institute of Technology. So uh, he will be the first to speak, and after him, uh, we welcome Mark J. Perry. Now, uh, Mark Perry is also at the University of Michigan. He is uh, working at the University of Michigan, uh, more or less, on a partial uh, basis while he works also for the American Enterprise Institute, and he divides his time uh, between Flint and uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, he received his doctorate, doctorate degree uh, from uh, George Mason University, and he also holds a master's in finance from the University of Minnesota. He's written widely on macroeconomics and uh, financial economics, and he is also a, a prolific editorial writer for um, such publications as the Wall Street Journal, Detroit News, uh, but he's perhaps best known for his economics blog, Carpe Diem, which has thousands of followers throughout the country and a national reputation and uh, you can visit his Carpe Diem blog on the American Enterprise Institute's website. So, uh, with those introductions, I now turn the, uh, the podium over to uh, Professor Weisskopf. Thank you very much, Dale, for the kind uh, introduction. I'm grateful to you and to the organizers of this uh, debate this evening for inviting me and Professor Perry to speak before you this evening. Uh, this is the third time I've been uh, here at Northwood uh, to speak, and I have to say I really appreciate Northwood's openness to a variety of perspectives on important issues. Today I will argue on behalf of raising the minimum wage, the federal minimum wage, to $10.10. I think that is a much better policy than failing to raise the minimum wage and leaving it at its current level of $7.25. Uh, now, later I will discuss other 
policies uh, suggested as alternatives to a Michigan wage hike, uh, sorry, to a minimum wage hike, uh, but that's probably for later stages of the debate, I'll come back to that. For now, I want to make the case for the rise in the minimum wage, preferable to leaving things as they are. First of all, uh, I think, and I'm going to show my major points on the slide here. Um, first of all, I think there is a basic moral case for a higher minimum wage, uh, as Professor Manchek uh, mentioned in reference to Adam Smith's views. Uh, the current minimum wage fails to provide even full-time workers with enough income to keep a family out of poverty. A full-time worker earning the minimum wage makes about $15,000 a year, less than a poverty line of $16,000 for a family of two, $20,000 for a family of three, and $24,000 for a family of four. Now, this is the historical record. Over the last 50 years, the real value of the minimum wage in terms of its purchasing power has declined by 33%. In current prices, it's dropped from $10.85 an hour to $7.25. Even though the U.S. economy has grown greatly over this period, and average worker productivity is up 140%. If the minimum wage had kept pace with average labor productivity and inflation, it would now be $26 an hour. The minimum wage hike to 10 would bring it from about 36% of the median wage of full-time workers to 50%. Indeed, the respected British weekly, The Economist, strongly oriented to free market economics, supports the minimum wage uh, at a level of roughly 50% of workers' median wages. The minimum wage increase has significant ripple effects. An increase of the federal minimum wage would increase pay directly for 18 million workers, about 18% of wage earners now earning less than the new $10.10 level. And indirectly for another 11 million workers, about 11% of wage earners now earning more than the new uh, proposed minimum wage. These figures are from a comprehensive study by the Economic Policy Institute. Raising the minimum wage reduces poverty, according to a strong consensus of economists. This is the conclusion of a meta-analysis by Arindrajit Dube surveying all metric estimates of the response of several different poverty measures to a rise of the minimum wage. Raising the minimum wage also contributes to greater income inequality. Indeed, growing income inequality in the United States is increasingly a source of concern for people across the global spectrum whether on moral, political, social, or economic grounds. There's much evidence, according to the same uh, EPI study, uh, the evidence suggests that about 70% of U.S. workers who would benefit from a minimum wage increase to $10.10 live in families earning less than $60,000 a year, and indeed 23% live in families earning less than $20,000 a year. To quote Dale Bowman and Paul Wilson, authors of an award-winning study and book entitled What Does the Minimum Wage Do?, published by the Upjohn Institute for Employment Research here in Kalamazoo, Michigan, the minimum wage is reasonably well targeted toward low-income populations. Further, raising the minimum wage increases aggregate demand. Over economic activity and employment depend far more on the level of aggregate demand for goods and services than on the level of worker wages. The level of aggregate demand is especially important in the contemporary economic context of the United States and indeed other countries around the world as well, given the slow recovery of the U.S. economy from the Great Recession and serious worries about secular stagnation in the future. Now, the poor spend a higher percentage of their income on goods and services than do the rich, so the greater income inequality resulting from a hike in the minimum wage boosts aggregate demand and leads businesses to hire more workers. A higher minimum wage reduces the welfare burden of taxpayers 
to finance programs which support low-wage earners, such as temporary assistance for needy families, TAMPs, for the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, and the Earned Income Tax Credit, EITC. These are all good programs, uh, but they're very heavily dependent upon by low-income workers now because of the low level of the minimum wage. The extent to which the taxpayer is footing the bill has been documented in a report by the University of California's Center for Labor Research and Education entitled The High Public, Federal, and State Cost of Low Wages. Furthermore, higher wages for low income earners reduce the incentive to resort to illegal means of obtaining money or goods, such as the sale of illegal drugs, a robbery, etc. And finally, uh, there's much evidence that a higher minimum wage is no bar to successful economic performance. Compared to the United States in the late 1960s, when the minimum wage was $10.85 in the current dollars, to the United States over the last five, six years, when the minimum wage is down to $7.25. Compared to Germany and the United States in recent years, with Germany's higher minimum wage at a level of roughly nine and a half dollars compared to our 7.25. And compare states like Minnesota and Wisconsin. The higher minimum wage Minnesota economy is doing a lot better than the lower minimum wage Wisconsin economy. Now, I'm not claiming that a higher minimum wage always improves overall economic performance, only that it is often accompanied good economic performance, and that when not excessive, it usually leads to other desirable outcomes. Now, there are many possible objections uh, to an increase in the minimum wage. And I want to address a few of these objections because I'm sure they'll be part of the discussion here this evening. The first objection uh, is that the minimum wage hikes the minimum wage hike benefits primarily unemployed teenagers and part-time workers. It does benefit some unneedy teenagers and some part-time workers. But in the case of raising the federal minimum wage to $10.10, only 12.5% of minimum wage affected workers would be teenagers, many nonetheless from needy families. The average age of a minimum wage affected worker is 35 years old. Only 14% of minimum wage affected workers work less than 20 hours per week. And why should we consider them any less deserving than others? And finally, minimum wage affected workers on average earn over half of their family income. These figures are from a comprehensive study by the Economic Policy Institute. Let me now turn to some of the major theoretical arguments that have been made against raising the minimum wage. Uh, one means that a higher minimum wage means businesses face higher labor costs and will reduce employment. This is, in fact, the most common objection to raising the minimum wage. But there is a strong research consensus that disemployment effects are small for a modest minimum wage rise and a new minimum wage not more than 50% of the median wage. That's indeed why the economist supports a minimum wage at that level. And this is a change. It used to be thought that the negative employment effects were very significant. Uh, but research over the past 20, 25 years, when taken as a whole, you can't rely on just one study, shows that the effects are possibly negative, but very modest. And that's because, why is that? I mean, elementary economics would teach you that there would be a significant, or at least some, disemployment effect. Uh, one of the, there are several reasons that one could point to. One is that higher wage costs are partially offset by lower turnover, which means lower costs of recruitment and training, and by increased productivity due to better motivation for workers. Studies suggest that worker hours, in fact, are more likely to be reduced than jobs. Uh, but this is partly due to workers' own voluntary decisions to reduce hours when wages rise. And finally, as noted earlier, under conditions of need and aggregate demand, as at present, a higher minimum wage increase increases consumer spending and leads businesses to hire more workers. Let me summarize the book by Bellman and Wolfson that I referred to earlier. And I'm quoting here from a report on the book. 
through many analysis of more than 200 scholarly papers regarding the minimum wage, the authors conclude that modest minimum wage increases raise wages for the working poor without substantially affecting employment or work hours, providing solid benefits with small costs. Go back here. Uh, the next point uh, made by critics of raising the minimum wage. A higher minimum wage means businesses will, at least in the long run, substitute capital for labor, reducing employment again. But only a very substantial increase of the minimum wage is likely to provide sufficient incentive for firms to revamp production by substituting for capital for labor. It's not that easy to make these kinds of substitutions. And once again, the level of employment depends fundamentally much more on the aggregate demand for goods and services than the level of worker wages. Another point made in criticism of minimum wage, minimum wage increases. A higher minimum wage forces consumers to pay more for the goods and services they buy, which amounts to a sales tax uh, disproportionately harming poor consumers. But, as we know, some of the higher wage costs of a minimum wage hike are offset by lower turnover and higher productivity. Some may come out of profits. So for even labor costs and the need for businesses to raise prices will rise considerably less than the wages of minimum wage affected workers. And even if a higher minimum wage does lead to somewhat higher prices in minimum wage affected firms, the labor costs resulting from a minimum wage hike are only a fraction of the firm's total costs. So the percentage rise in prices for consumers would be much lower than the percentage rise in the minimum wage itself. Furthermore, the products of minimum wage affected firms whose prices might actually rise constitute only a fraction of the goods and services bought by consumers. So the negative impact on the purchasing power of the minimum wage affected workers would be much smaller than the positive impact of a minimum wage hike on their income. Now it's true that poor families without minimum wage affected workers would lose some purchasing power because of any price increases that might result from a minimum wage increase. But the demonstrated positive effect of a minimum wage increase on poverty reduction means that many more poor families would benefit than would lose. Now, there are interesting alternative policies. I just say I still have two minutes left, so I'll go into this. Uh, to raise the earnings of low-wage workers, other than raising the minimum wage. It's not the only way to do it. For example, raising the earned income tax credit uh, or government wage subsidies, both of which have been uh, proposed from various parts of the political spectrum, uh, and in particular have been supported by a good number of conservatives. But here the problem is not the principle, uh, but the practice. They both require increases in taxation and government spending at a time when government finances are tightly constrained and there's much popular opposition to tax increases. The minimum wage increase doesn't require more taxation and government spending. In fact, it reduces the need for both, as I mentioned earlier. Secondly, there's overwhelming public support for a minimum wage increase, less for the EITC and much less for government-funded wage subsidies. is therefore far preferable to the overwhelmingly likely alternative, which is no action whatsoever to increase the wages of low-wage workers. Expanding the ITC is politically more feasible, but still very difficult under current conditions. And as for the wage subsidy proposal, in principle, a well-structured system of government wage subsidies for low-wage workers would be the best policy. But in practice, it seems to be politically off the table. I will close here. My time is up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Gail. Thank you, Glenn, for organizing our evening tonight. Um, 
Let me start with a, a slide here. This is from 1987. This is the New York Times opinion page, and the headline was the right minimum wage is zero dollars an hour. That kind of summarizes my opinion. I agree with the New York Times back in 1987. And we really only have two choices in the economy. Um, wages, prices, and interest rates can be set by the natural forces of the market through the inter interaction of supply and demand, or the artificial and arbitrary forces of the government via elected officials and bureaucrats. Bureaucrats. Like all other cases, whether it's the market for gasoline, wheat, college professors, or the market for unskilled workers, I'll argue that market prices and wages are always superior to government mandated price controls. And like I say, I agree with the New York Times in 1987, and what I think are really the majority of economists, that the right minimum wage is zero dollars an hour, which is another way of saying that we're better off without government mandated and government enforced price and wage controls. As an example, if you're willing to come to the American Enterprise Institute or the Mackinac Center for Public Policy and work for a semester as an unpaid intern to gain valuable work experience, I support your right to work for zero dollars an hour or any other wage that you negotiate with an employer. I would argue that the government has no legitimate role to prevent, criminalize, or outlaw mutually beneficial voluntary labor arrangements with minimum wage legislation. As a market example, I took these pictures at the Williston Walmart last summer where they were paying more than $17 an hour for starting wages for often for unskilled workers. And so I would say that that wage accurately reflects the supply and demand conditions in that unique labor market that has been characterized by labor shortages. They have jobless rates in Williams County, where Williston is located uh, below 1% in recent years, and now it's currently at 1.8%. So the point would be is that that market wage in Williston, even for unskilled workers, means something important because it's determined by market forces and can easily be adjusted up or down to reflect changes in the market. So perhaps Walmart might have tried $14 an hour and couldn't find enough workers, so they raised the wage to $17 and above, and if $17 today results in way more applicants than job openings, Walmart will be sure to reduce the starting wages. So the bottom line is that market wages accurately reflect lo local labor market conditions, and they can be adjusted up or down and represent market efficiency in terms of a market clearing wage that represents equilibrium in the market and eliminates shortages or surpluses. Once we deviate from the market wage, we're in an area of inefficiency. What about government mandated minimum wages like the proposed 1010 an hour for Michigan and nationally? Well, the question would be why 1010 and not, and not 910 or 1110 or 1210 or 110? Now, Obama said he preferred 1010 because it's easy to remember. So in other words, they often use what I call the PFA formula. It's plucked from the air. It's just some number that's arbitrary. So I would say that minimum wages are almost always arbitrary and never based on any sound economic analysis. It's not as if a team of economists did an extensive national labor market study and produced a 50-page report based on some comprehensive cost-benefit analysis that concluded that 10, 10 an hour was the optimal national minimum wage and was the one that would maximize net benefits or minimize net cost. Well, it's always some arbitrary wage that is never really defended by any systematic economic analysis. It's also a uniform minimum wage for the entire country that doesn't reflect the dynamic differences in the cost of living between, let's say, Midland, Michigan, and Chicago, Illinois, and doesn't reflect the dynamic changes in different industries. A national minimum wage is always a typical one-size-fits-all government approach, which really means one-size-fits-none. Now, I think our minimum wage advocates will make a much stronger case for government-mandated minimum wages enacted at the local level than is the case for a uniform state or national minimum wage. And the next point is that ultimately the minimum wage is not really a political problem the way we usually think about it. It's a simple math problem. It's small business math, restaurant math, retail math. Now, there simply isn't any magic pot of money that lets employers pay higher wages just because the government says so without making adjustments elsewhere, like cutting workers' hours, reducing their non-cash fringe benefits, and or passing the higher wages along to consumers in the form of higher prices. 
So let's look at the math of the minimum wage, that adjusted adjustments to a higher mandated minimum wage and higher labor costs can only come from three places. Unskilled workers who are working at the minimum wage, the owners or shareholders of companies who employ minimum, uh, unskilled workers, and or the customers who patronize businesses that employ unskilled workers. So if we look at the total compensation for an unskilled or limited experienced worker, it's the monetary wages, the hours worked, plus the fringe benefits, plus on-the-job training provided by the employer, plus other non-wage job attributes. So I would argue that if the monetary wages go up, adjustments will be made along all these other margins or dimensions to try to keep the total compensation for an unskilled worker at the same level. Think about all the different non-wage job attributes where adjustments could be made. Flexibility in scheduling. You used to work eight hours a day, now you work three hours in the morning and then two hours in the afternoon. The extent or strictness of work demands. Kindness and amiability in the workplace. Consideration and respect in the workplace. Upward mobility in the organization. Health insurance, on-the-job training, lockers for workers, free or discounted food for restaurant workers, transportation parking for workers. Let's say I own a building downtown and I used to give workers free parking in the back of the building. Now that I'm paying higher minimum wage, I rent those spaces out and workers are on their own to find their own paid parking. The quality of air conditioning and lighting. The number, quality, and cleanliness of restrooms for use by workers. Workplace comfort and workplace safety. Employee discounts on employers' merchandise. Free or reduced cost uniforms. Company sponsored holiday parties, picnics, and sporting events. Tuition assistance and scholarships. Parking lot maintenance and landscaping around the place of employment. Bonuses and profit sharing. Those will all be, could be potentially adjusted. So to the extent that minimum wage increases are completely offset by employers naturally reducing hours and the non-wage attributes offered to their employees to remain profitable, even the unskilled workers who remain employed will not necessarily be better off from a minimum wage hike. The workers' total compensation could stay the same or maybe even be reduced if the reductions in non-wage attributes more than offset the artificial increase in monetary wages. So in the same way that a tenant who's able to find a rent-controlled apartment in Manhattan who paid below market rent, but also live in a reduced quality housing unit. It's also the case that the unskilled worker who managed to, to keep or find a job following an above market minimum wage hike will work in a reduced quality work environment with reduced non-wage attributes, including possibly hours and fringe benefits that have been reduced. Here's another way to think about it. Unskilled workers have no skills. Unskilled workers can only acquire job skills and experience by having a job from an employer who provides them with a very valuable form of comp compensation on the job training. Unskilled workers will never acquire on the job training while unemployed. The minimum wage forces employers to discriminate against unskilled workers in favor of skilled workers to reduce employers' cost of providing on the job training and significantly increases the number of unskilled workers who will have difficulty finding a job. Without a job, unskilled workers can acquire on-the-job training and then they will continue to have those skills and now we're back at number one. Henry Payne of the Detroit News pointed it out this way very clearly in these two cartoons. Congratulations, I raised your minimum wage to $15 an hour, and so now you can't work your way up to the labor market, labor market ladder unless you can get on the first step of the ladder. So by denying workers access to an uh, entry-level job, they're often then denied the access to gain on-the-job training. Okay, now, the other way that there could be an adjustment is that the uh, owners of the industry, the owners of businesses, have to absorb higher labor costs in the form of reduced profits, lower share prices, and lower dividends. And now, I would argue that that's a form of legal plunder or legal theft via Bastiat. How to tell if it's legal plunder or theft? The question would be, does a law facilitate the taking of property, profits, or assets from some persons that would belong belongs to them, to then be given forcibly by law to others that does not belong to them. Passing a minimum wage law that allows unskilled workers to extract an additional three to five, seven, three, five or seven dollars an hour from their employers, I would argue that's no different than passing a law that legally authorizes an employee to take a hundred or two hundred or three hundred dollars each week from the cash register of their employer. 
beyond the ethical objection to the minimum wage laws as a form of legal plunder, there's the practical problem that firms, including small businesses and restaurants, don't have some magic pile of money sitting around that can be used to pay for government man mandated wage increases. Retailers and restaurants operate on razor thin margins and don't have excess profits with which to pay higher government mandated minimum wages. Higher minimum wages could easily force some companies to either go out of business and could prevent new ones from starting. When you ask the general public what is the typical profit margin for a company operating in the U.S. economy, people in the general population think it's 36 percent. That's way higher than it really is. The average profit margin, profits after tax divided by sales revenue, is about 6.3 percent on average. It's less than 3 percent for discount retailers like Walmart, and it's only 2.1 percent on average for restaurants. What does that mean? Well, think about for a typical restaurant with a 2.1% profit margin, let's say they operate 365 days a year, they would have to operate from January 1st to December 24th, and all of the sales revenue from those days of the year would cover the restaurant's expenses for the year, and then the sales roughly on the last eight days of the year would represent its profit. So that's a way to illustrate the razor-thin margins of restaurants, and many of them could be forced to go out of business or wouldn't expand or restaurants won't open in that kind of environment with higher minimum wages. Um, okay. Then, Employers could also pass on higher labor costs to customers in the form of higher prices. Now, I would say there's no material difference between a government-mandated minimum wage that is financed by higher prices and a law that legally allows workers to take money from the pockets of the customers they enter the store. For restaurants, higher minimum, higher menu prices may not allow owners to fully recoup higher labor costs and remain profitable. Many of their non-labor costs will go up as well. Some restaurants' rent, monthly rent, is based on a percentage of sales, like 7% of sales. So when restaurants raise their prices, so the revenue might go up, but then their rent is also going to go up. It's also possible that other costs will go up, like the cost of food and other restaurant supplies and services, because the companies that supply food, linens, restaurant supplies and equipment, and services like landscaping, window washing, and snow removal all employ minimum wage workers, so their labor costs will increase, which will get passed along to the restaurants in the form of higher prices. Further, demand for restaurant meals is very price sensitive. So restaurants that try to raise prices by 10% could actually experience a fall in revenue if meals served falls by, let's say, 15%, and if customers now order less expensive items. And there's a very good close substitute for restaurant meals, and that's food at home. So if minimum wage increases result in higher menu prices, many customers will economize on eating out in favor of eating at home. Also, minimum wage workers may have increased income, but if higher prices in general result, they'll face higher costs for everything they buy, including food, clothing, rent, transportation, which could leave them no better off than before. So to summarize my objections to the minimum wage in favor of market prices and wages, I have 10 uh, items here to, to, to finish up with. First of all, minimum wages are always arbitrary and never based on sound economic analysis. Why 10-10? Why not 11-10? Why not 5 why 15 A uniform federal minimum wage may be suboptimal for many states, and uniform state minimum wage wages may be suboptimal for many cities. A one-size-fits-all approach to the minimum wage is really a one-size-fits-none. Minimum wage laws require taxpayer-funded monitoring and enforcement mechanisms, whereas market wages don't. Minimum wage laws discriminate against unskilled workers in favor of skilled workers, and the greatest amount of discrimination takes place against minority groups like blacks. Economist Milton Friedman called the minimum wage law the most anti-black law in America. Adjustments to total compensation following minimum wage laws will disadvantage workers in the form of redu reduced hours, reduced fringe benefits, and reduced on-the-job training in a lower quality work environment. Many unskilled workers will be unable to find work and will be denied, denied valuable on-the-job training and the opportunity of, to acquire experience and skills. Minimum wage laws prevent mutually advantageous voluntary labor agreements to take place to the extent that higher minimum wages do result in lower profits or higher prices. That's a form of plunder from employers and consumers, which I find objectionable. 
market wages are efficient, government mandated wages are inefficient. And finally, like all government price controls, minimum wage laws are distortionary. And if you trust government officials and politicians to set a minimum wage for unskilled workers, you should logically trust those same bureaucrats to set all prices, wages, and interest rates in the economy. And the inevitable result will be Soviet-style central planning, command, and control, and economic chaos, like in Cuba, North Korea, and Venezuela. If you agree that economy-wide central planning if you agree that economy about central planning and price controls would be undesirable, then I think you should also agree that the minimum wage laws and arbitrary artificial government mandated price control would be undesirable. There are better ways to help unskilled workers than a distortionary government price control. Thank you. Professor Weisskopf to ask a question. Uh, Professor Perry. Yes. You may ask the first question on uh, okay. I guess my, my first question uh, is uh, you set up a sharp contrast between the big market and the rules of supply and demand on the one hand and uh, arbitrary government and economy wide central planning on the other side. Uh, the real world is full of mixed systems that embody various degrees of openness to the market and various degrees of government regulation. But do you rule out the possibility or desirability of everything in between a purely market system and a completely centralized bureaucratic authoritarian system? Well, I think in terms of maximizing economic efficiency and mass maximizing social welfare for the economy, I think we should avoid government mandated price controls, interest rate controls, and um, yeah, price, wage, and interest rate controls. So just like in, as an example, if, if the, the goal is to create public policy to make housing affordable, the worst possible public policy is a rent control law. There's m much better ways to do that than to, than to distort the market through the price system. And so that's what, what I, how I would respond, is that the, in the, uh, the market for unskilled workers, that the, the worst policy is to distort the market in the form of artificial government mandates through wage controls. And we should look to other ways to, uh, to try to address the problem of low income uh, for unskilled workers and not through distorting the unskilled market for labor with a minimum wage law. Yes, I certainly agree there are different ways to do it, and they often involve government policy. Uh, on this question, let me ask you, certainly unskilled workers need more jobs than are available now, but workers at many levels need more jobs than any company is offering them. Uh, would you not agree that their job prospects depend significantly on the larger macroeconomic conditions, and in particular the level of yeah, but I think the way to maximize employment opportunities um, would be to have the least amount of regulation in the labor markets and the least amount of regulation and least amount of taxes in the economy, because I think that's the, the path to more prosperity and more employment opportunities. The minimum wage is just another example of a burden or an artificial constraint on the labor market for unskilled workers, and so I think that's going to destroy jobs or eliminate employment opportunities, and so I think that the hands-off approach really is the way to increase employment opportunities throughout the economy, not just for unskilled workers, but for skilled workers. Well, 
I would trust the, the market and the role of business owners to determine the optimal amount of wages for their industry. I mean, Thomas Sowell always says that people have never run one business for one day suddenly know what wages companies are supposed to pay. So I would say if there was a payoff, if it maximized profits by increasing wages to, in, to, lower, to increase productivity and lower turnover, that firms, profit-seeking, profit-maximizing firms would do that on their own. They don't need. They don't need to be forced to do that by bureaucrats in Lansing or elected officials in Washington D.C. That if they find through trial and error and uh, through their best business practices that higher wages reduce turnover, then they'll do that naturally and automatically, and they won't need bureaucrats in Lansing or Washington D.C. to force them and tell them that that's what they should do. Well, I think smart businesses have done that. Because I think it's a little bit of a myth that people like start at the minimum wage as a teenager and then like 10 years later they're still working at the minimum wage. They've never received a promotion. They've never received a wage increase. I think a minimum wage is a starting wage. Once you get that starting wage and get that job and get experience, and I think that's the path to higher wages naturally as you gain experience. So we want to make sure we maximize the amount of employment opportunities by people getting the initial um, job with limited uh, unskilled I mean, think of when we say unskilled, it means you have no skills. So for an employer to pay you, it's based on the fact that you have no skills. You get skills by having a job. And I would just point out this. Two of the current Walmart executives right now, two of the current vice presidents at Walmart, started out as hourly associates at the beginning of their career. So the idea that people start at the minimum wage, never go anywhere, they're trying to raise a family, they get married, they have kids, they're still earning the minimum wage. I mean, almost any even fast food outlet will give every give the minimum wage workers a, 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 an increase in their wages after, let's say, the first 90 days. So the idea that it's a dead-end job for everybody and they're stuck at the minimum wage forever, I think, is not consistent with the evidence that shows that even very, very highly paid executives now at Walmart started out as probably a minimum wage hourly associate. Any questions for Professor Weisskopf? No, Tom. Um, how do we respond to Milton Friedman's claim that the minimum wage is the most anti-black law in America? Do you agree? And how do we uh, think about it? I do not agree. You know, what, what is anti-black is an economy that fails to provide jobs for than the black teenage unemployment is about twice um, white teenage unemployment and doesn't does the minimum wage have nothing to do with that at all because a higher minimum wage reduces the cost of discrimination for an employer so just by economic theory we would expect the amount of discrimination to go up against unskilled workers and against minority unskilled workers um, with an artificial You mentioned uh, Germany, and actually Germany never had a minimum wage, I don't think, until the beginning of this year. Well, Germany has had a minimum wage for some time, but they, they have also, uh, Germany has uh, something else which I suspect you would not approve of, and that is the system of co-determination in enterprises that gives workers a very significant voice in the uh, affairs of a firm, and which is one way of helping to uh, balance uh, the balance of power between 
employers and workers. Uh, I see the minimum wage as one element in a strategy that enables workers and employers to bargain and to interact on more equal terms than has been the case when the minimum wage is very low, uh, when unions think this out, uh, and when workers have very few options. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure Germany just recently enacted a minimum wage, but when you look at the European countries, about half of them had minimum wages and about half of them had no minimum wage. And when you look at the overall unemployment rates in the European countries that don't have a minimum wage, it's significantly lower than the countries that do have minimum wages. So I think there's some evidence that when you can... I don't think that's true. Oh, well, it's absolutely true. It varies across countries. Uh, Denmark, in fact, Denmark has relatively high minimum wages and a low unemployment. Yeah, but if you take the countries as a group that have a minimum wage and look at their average unemployment rate compared to the countries that don't have a minimum wage and their average minimum, uh, their average unemployment rate, there's a significant difference that the well, countries I would accept the notion that the minimum wage is the primary determinant of the unemployment rate. To the contrary, the primary determinant of the unemployment rate is the macroeconomic context, which is significantly influenced by governments in pursuing fiscal and monetary policy. Yeah, now, one of the interesting things is, as you probably know, the minimum wage has been in, or is on the way to a $15 minimum wage in the cities of Seattle, San Francisco, and Los Angeles, and California is now considering a statewide $15 minimum wage. The early reports that have been coming in, and I've documented this on my blog, is that uh, restaurant employment in Seattle has suffered since the beginning of the year when they've had their first increase in the minimum wage. The, well, LA, Los Angeles has a hotel workers' minimum wage that went up this year to above 15, I think. And then in San Francisco, they're implementing the $15 minimum wage. So there are already some early reports. Yeah, the early reports are that the increases in the minimum wage on the West Coast are having negative employment, negative employment effects already this year. So I think there's some support for the empirical evidence showing. What is the question? Do you, how do you respond to the fact that the $15 minimum wages on the West Coast are having negative employment effects? First, I would say it's too early to draw conclusions, but from a general point, uh, we can't determine the impact of the $15 minimum wage simply by looking at what happens to restaurants in those areas. The minimum wage also has effect on purchasing power of workers and of consumers generally in the affected areas. So we have to look at the larger context, not just of the restaurant industry, but what happens to the whole city economy. Uh, and therefore, it's very difficult to tease out what has been the direct impact of the minimum wage. Uh, I will agree with you on one point, though, and, and that is that in principle, the minimum wage ought not to be the same across the country. You're absolutely right. I think the people who support the minimum wage have worked on this and have proposed that the minimum wage should indeed be geared to cost of living in different areas. I don't support a $15 minimum wage nationally for exactly that reason. In some cities, it may well make sense when the cost of living is very high, uh, but uh, you have to, in order to have it work properly, you really do have to have it very according to local conditions. Okay. All right. We are going to uh, take a short break, 10 minutes. Uh, feel free to. Uh... You have to
question would be, I would much rather make $10 today than $11 in 1966. That would be my opinion. It's because spending $10 today, I get so much more. Is it? Of course. But for the, for the business services that, now, housing may be different. Housing may be the exception. Right, when you look at the other things on Adam Smith's list, food, shelter, uh, not shelter, uh, clothing. Right. So you mentioned food, shelter, clothing. I would say at least two of those categories are much rather than make today's minimum wage. But, yes, that's uh, it's a difficult comparison to make. $10.95 since 1968 compared to $10.10 today. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
from our audience. Uh, the first question is for Professor Weisskopf. Uh, you argue that 1010 is a good minimum wage across the nation, but you stated that $15 is not. How do you determine what the minimum wage should be? Well, this is a good question. Let the markets decide worker wages. Do you think that some businesses may take advantage of their workers? If so, what can we put in place then to protect workers? Well, I think the uh, market forces of competition are the worker's best friend. And when, uh, as an example, when I was in Williston, North Dakota, um, Walmart was not being forced to pay 17 an hour by, by bureaucrats or elected officials. They were paying 17 an hour and up to attract starting, um, to, for workers to, to take jobs there. Um, and so in that case, you know, that was the competition was the worker's best friend, that the, you could go to Williston, North Dakota and start at seventeen twenty-five an hour or not because they were in such competition for unskilled workers that the wages got bid up way, you know, more than twice the national wage of seven and a quarter. So I think that's how workers could be protected is in a thriving, booming economy, if we can never get, get to that condition again, that that's what protects workers is competition because 
employers are competing against other employees to hire the best workers and retain the best workers. So I would say that competition works in the favor of employees when it's a very competitive labor market. And just as one example, we can see what happened in Williston, North Dakota, when wages got bid up to $17 an hour and higher because of competition, not because of any kind of government edict or law or mandate. Professor Weisskopf, uh, you say that uh, when hours are reduced due to minimum wage increases, it is usually voluntary. Um, it is the desire of the employee rather than the employer. Um, isn't this because they're trying to maintain their eligibility for government programs? Well, first of all, I say that it's usually the case. Responsibility for government programs uh, or others. Well, um, this question is not directed toward either one, so feel free to respond. Um, how do you respond to the impact of an approximate 40% increase in employee wages to employees already making above 1010? Uh, in other words, is there going to be a ratcheting effect on the cost of other employees as they try to maintain their ranking within the company? Um, or will we see companies raising the level of their lowest paid workers and leaving the level of wages for their higher paid workers unchanged? I think we agree that there'll be some ripples that probably the lowest wage understand the question correctly. That is the effect of the minimum wage is to put it some resentment effect that if I've worked my way up, if I started at seven a quarter and I've gained experience, I've been working for a national food chain for a couple years and I've worked my way up to $15 an hour and now the, the local minimum wage was up to $15 an hour and people that just come in off the street with no skills get the same wage that I'm getting. That could create resentment within the organization. Of course, I'm going to want a lot more than $15 an hour. And so that, of course, would be the ripple effect. And so that could then have an even more adverse effect on uh, companies that are struggling to get by and barely able, barely able to stay in business currently. And then not only do the minimum wage goes up, but then all the rest of the labor costs go up. So that could have significant ripple effects that could help put some small businesses out of business. I'd just like to know, you're debating on 10 10 wage, not a 15 dollar wage. increased labor costs for a small company beyond the increase in the minimum wage workers. If the more skilled workers were also getting wage increases as a result of the minimum wage increase, it'll artificially push everybody's wages up. About half the number of workers. Professor Perry, 
if the market wage is superior to the minimum wage, then why aren't all jobs paying more than the minimum wage? Yes, I'm not sure. Uh, I guess you need to clarify what you meant by saying the market wage is superior. Well, I mean, this, uh, ultimately, market wages are supposed to reflect workers' productivity, and so um, you know, wages are determined by the workers' productivity. And um, well, can you read the question again? Well, the question, the, the, the I, I understand that the question is asking if minimum wages are considered superior to, I'm sorry, if market wages are considered superior, in what way superior? Uh, why are there more jobs than uh, paying minimum wage? Well, because I think again that. The we think of the minimum wage as an entry level a starting wage for unskilled workers who by definition don't have skills and need to be trained and get on the job training. And so if you talk to any fast food employer, the typical practice would be at McDonald's, let's say. Maybe you start at the minimum wage. After 90 days, if you show up on time and show that you have some skills and you're nice to customers, then you would automatically get um, a boost above the starting minimum wage. So again, I think that a minimum wage is an entry wage doesn't mean that that's what most um, unskilled workers make after some period of time when they gain experience and then they automatically would see wages increase and in some cases then, in fact, if you think about this too, 75% of Walmart management team started as hourly associates. So the workers who are really good don't start at the minimum wage and stay there, they automatically get moved up and get promoted. And so there's those job opportunities that can be provided by national chains like Walmart that local merchants can't provide. Okay, that concludes our period of questions. Uh, it may be if you submitted a question that wasn't addressed here from the podium, uh, maybe uh, there will be an opportunity to get your question answered uh, afterwards. And I want to thank both our speakers uh, for their input tonight, and I want to thank all of you for your attention. And that concludes our program. Oh, wait. Oh, I'm sorry. It doesn't conclude our program. I'm sorry. Each, each uh, side has uh, an opportunity to make a closing statement. Okay, so we'll begin with Professor Wise. Let's speak from here. Perry's first? Okay. Okay. Okay, as my uh, closing uh, remarks, I'd just like to say that off, well, Tom and other people have sometimes referred to empirical studies that find no significant employment effects because of the minimum wage, or that states like Minnesota um, have minimum wages and their economy is, is doing very well. But saying that there's no significant employment effects doesn't necessarily mean that there's no negative employment effects at all. So for example, let's say that before and after the minimum wage, the same number of people are working in entry level jobs, but now after the minimum wage, their hours have been cut. Or as I mentioned before, their fringe benefits have been cut. Or there's been other adjustments that make them the same off or maybe even worse off. So just saying the same number of people are employed and there's no negative employment effects because of minimum wage doesn't, it's not the same as saying there's no negative effects at all. Look, let me give you one final example. Um, that um, the CEO, Sally Smith of Buffalo Wild Wings was interviewed last week in the Wall Street Journal. Buffalo Wild Wings has about a thousand stores around the country and they're going through a major expansion. They're gonna open a hundred new outlets by the end of the year. She was asked how the $15 an hour minimum wage, I know we're debating 10-10, but just as an example, she was asked how does the $15 minimum wage affect your decision? She said, well, we have one store in Seattle and we have some stores on the West Coast, but we're not going to do any expansion there because of the $15 minimum wage. They're going to shop around the country and they're going to locate stores where labor costs are more attractive and more competitive to them. So then you could say, well, there wasn't any negative employment effect. There's still one Buffalo Wild Wings in Seattle. They didn't close down. They're still there. But then the question is always, well, what would it have been if they didn't have the minimum wage at all? Then maybe instead of one Buffalo Wild Wings, there could have been five or ten. Or in any country in Europe that has uh, minimum wage or the state of Minnesota, the question would always be, well, maybe they're doing okay with the minimum wage, but maybe they'd be doing a lot better without the minimum wage, and we can never know for sure the jobs that weren't created or the restaurants that weren't opened because of the minimum wage. So that's how I'll end my comments. Thank you.
and now that really does conclude our program. So thank you, and thank our speakers once again. And don't forget, next week's debate, uh, if you have the opportunity to come to that one as well.